right, good evening everybody. We want to thank you all for coming and uh, we want to just make sure everyone's in the, the right room. This is the public meeting for the Gary Master Park Design Project. And so we want to thank you all for coming. I'm excited about this project, excited to see a new park coming into Pinecrest and hopefully everyone else here can, can get just as excited, get behind these projects and make sure that we get the best park for our community. Um, so what we've got is a, approximately a 45 minute presentation that's going to um, showcase all the data that we've already collected from the surveys that have gone out. I believe uh, now there's 956 responses to the survey that went out, so we're really excited about the response that we received and, uh, and there's a lot of information to go over. So my name is Robert Mattis, I'm the Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, this is Matt Mandem. Uh, Matt is from MKSK. He's the um, he's our consultant for the design for uh, for the conceptual design for this project. Um, what's going to happen throughout the uh, the afternoon is we'll, or the evening we'll do the presentation and Matt's going to um, lead you through some different exercises uh, to you know start getting a little bit more information and dig a little bit deeper about what might interest you and to um, really have a discussion about what the future of this park is going to be. So we want to thank you very much. A few housekeeping items is um, obviously exits are on both sides. If you need to use a restroom, it's right through these doors, uh, men's and women's. And there is water, coffee, and cookies up on the back. Please help yourself at any time. This is a discussion, so I do want to make sure this is clear. This is a discussion, not a debate. And so there's going to be varying uh, degrees of agreement on some of the things that other people are saying, um, and that's okay. We don't need everybody to agree on everything, but we do need to make sure that we're cordial and we do need to make sure that we have an open conversation so that we can get the most feedback as possible so that we can present to council the best design possible. So with that, I'm gonna let Matt take it away and, and you can do what you need. All right, excellent. Uh, I'm not gonna use the mic, is that okay? Can you guys hear me in the back? Excellent, all right. So uh, happy to be here, uh, excited about this project is too. Um, parks are one of the things that I love doing as a landscape architect. I guess I should probably explain. Uh, I've been practicing for about 21 years. I'm a planner and landscape architect. Uh, have been doing a lot of projects all over the world and all over the country. And, and parks are one of the things that I love most about doing. And big or small, it doesn't matter because I think it's a great opportunity to really design much needed open public space. Uh, especially as we've learned the last couple of years, you can't have enough really quality open space uh, in our communities. Uh, brings us together, it's an opportunity for us to, to have recreation and also to socialize. So tonight, what we're going to share with you, it's basically a two-part conversation, as Rob was mentioning. We have a, a short presentation that's going to run through all of the questions or all the data that we got from the online survey. We're also going to touch on a brief analysis uh, of the park itself and also start to tease out and start to finalize some of the ideas of what this park could be from a program standpoint. That same information is also represented on the boards over here on the other side. And so that would be the second part. And what we would like to do, you can see on these chairs here, there's some sticky notes. Uh, and what we would like to do, especially for the last three boards, uh, is to have you all uh, stick some stickers on there on images that you guys think fit the type of character and the program that you would like to have in this park. And they range from uh, water features to playground to court sports to also just how do you engage with nature. Again, this is all about us. And I guess let me just click the, move the slide here. So real quickly from a project standpoint, we are in the discovery phase. So the discovery phase is basically the public engagement that we're doing right now. So getting feedback from the online survey, processing that information and finalizing what we want to do from a program standpoint. From there, we'll move into the vision phase, which is where we're going to start to develop two or three different concepts of how this space can start to come and be realized. And then lastly, we're going to have the connect phase, which is then, once we present to council, finalize the final view, the final project, uh, and be able to put that uh, package together so that Rob can take it to the street and then place uh, back out for bidding for uh, working drawings uh, for CD drawing to be implemented. This whole process, we're estimating about a three to four month period, so it's a pretty quick window which we're moving, but that's okay because I think um, there's a lot of great information that we already have, and this park uh, being the size of this will allow us to move pretty quickly. 
Now, from the public survey standpoint, I, I must say that uh, 954 respondents, I, of all the respondents that we've had in the communities, that's one of the highest, so <coughs> congratulations. Really appreciate that, the, the feedback. These type of exercises are really important for us. It helps us understand and connect better with what the community wants. Helps us understand you know, what their focus is as far as the open spaces. So receiving this amount of uh, comments has been really helpful and it's been really fruitful for us as we develop this, this part. So <clears throat> one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, the first question that we had, what three community parks or recreation facilities do you most awfully visit? And I think it's no surprise that the, the community center was number one, followed by this park, and then Sunnyland as well, right? Those are your three most prominent parks. They have a lot of features, a lot of various features and experiences with them, so it's no surprise there. The second question is, how often do you and your members or households visit community parks and recreation facilities? 41% uh, said once a week or more, uh, which is pretty high. That's, that's really encouraging, as well as, um, one to two times a month was 27% and 14% daily or uh, daily or almost daily. That's a pretty high percentage of park usage that you get uh, for a community of this size. And that's a really great indicator that this park is really interesting and people really be interested in how it's being developed. Sorry about that. <laughs> Primary reasons for why you would visit these parks, right? And we provided a, a whole list of different options for people to pick. Obviously, number one, 53% of the respondents said uh, connect with nature. Uh, that question is a very interesting one. It's a very common one. One of the things that we want to think about with that one in particular is what type of connections with outdoor nature are you talking about? Are we talking about simple walking paths, benches? Uh, are we talking about maybe providing some garden spaces? or other types of recreation that allows you to connect with nature. I think walk, run, bike, exercise is also a high one. <clears throat> so the idea of loop paths or, or paths in general throughout the park are gonna be key. Play sports, so these would be more of your uh, court games, basketball, pickleball, uh, or uh, I think we also mentioned in their futsal. Play equipment, so those would be playgrounds uh, for, for smaller kids uh, in different ages. Uh, family activities, those could be picnic opportunities, uses of shelters where people kind of have birthdays or social events, that sort of thing. Uh, meet friends, just kind of hang out and just sit in the park and, and, and hang out with friends. 20% uh, participate in programming, so those would be programming features that the, the community would offer, whether it's arts and crafts or, out, or, or exercise or anything along those lines. Fitness equipment, um, Dog walking and other and general leisure are all about the same, 15 to 13 percent. But again, the, the numbers at the top here connect with nature, uh, walk, exercise, and play sports were predominantly the, the top three that we received in this uh, survey. So as we start to drill down and talk about sports courts, what rises to the top? Um, and obviously you can see here, 63% said pickleball. <laughs> and by the green shirts in here, I think that's probably right. Uh, so, and obviously pickleball is a great sport. It's really gaining a lot of uh, popularity over the last few years. We're seeing this a lot in a lot of the communities. It's a, it's a great activity. It's a pretty efficient layout as far as we talk about not taking up so much space in parks. You basically get two two courts per tennis court. Uh, so it's, it's really great from that standpoint. Uh, we also put in their basketball. Basketball is also another great sport, but depending upon where those basketball courts are, some there, there's some trade-offs with that. There's a little bit more noise, it's a little more youth, you know. Uh, so it's a little bit different type of uh, user. Uh, futsal, uh, I don't know if, how many people are familiar with futsal, but futsal is basically soccer on a court that's caged in. We're seeing a lot of popularity with that in certain demographics in certain places around the country. And so we thought that that might be an interesting thing. It did rate as high as others. And then others, so that would be just about anything. That could be shuffle, that could be tennis, that could be a bunch of other things. We didn't really put any specifics in there, nor did I think we, well, we did get a few. We got volleyball as one, uh, no sports at all, and tennis. Uh, volleyball being 76 
uh, respondents, no sports 61 and tennis 45. So some of the other courts were a little bit all over the place, but predominantly the survey is pretty clear. Pickleball is, is one of the, the main things. So not sure how that fits into the program yet. Not sure what the total amount of that would be as far as courts, but that's definitely something as we develop the plans and test fit other program that we'll be able to flush out uh, as we get into the concepts. The following is, uh, please rank the importance of following potential park features. And so on a scale of one to six, so this is one over here and six, six being the most preferred, one being the least preferred. Again, walking paths was, was rated pretty high, 4.3 overall from the survey. Uh, walking paths paved, I, I mean, walking paths natural, meaning that it's probably more of a gravel base instead of a concrete or asphalt, whereas paved was slightly less at 4.1. Again, sports courts rated pretty high, 4.1. I would imagine most of that was pickleball again, uh, rating in there. Shelters were also high, uh, and shelters are obviously important. You know, this is South Florida, it's hot, it does rain. So trying to provide some opportunities for cover, for comfort. You can see, uh, in one of the, I think it's the, the second to last board over there, we have a series of different shelter types that we think could be applied here. Uh, and one of them has the ability to put fans in there and have roll up doors so that it's more four season. So uh, I'd be curious to see what that, you know, what the community feels about that. Um, it's, it's one thing to, you know, have these beautiful, beautiful gazebos and shelters out there, but if no one's using them, then it, it's kind of like, what's the point? So how do we get a little bit more value out of those? Community gardens also rated relatively high, almost four. Now community gardens could be a, a, different, a couple different things. You could grow vegetables there, you could also grow flowers. They take on different types of community gardens. Uh, we're seeing that as being quite popular as well uh, throughout a lot of different communities. Play structures, again, you can never have too many play structures, especially for the little ones. It's important to speak to when we have play structures that it's for all ages, not just one, one group, so that uh, so kids can grow into that and play. Nature observation, conservation area rated at 3.7. So is, are there opportunities to experience nature in a different way, whether it's uh, a natural meadow uh, sort of garden. Uh, is there ways that maybe we can uh, introduce some, uh, you know, different types of birdhouses to, to attract some wildlife for sound and interest? There's a lot of different things we can do from an observation standpoint. Pollinator gardens are really important. Uh, uh, that's that's also quite popular. A lot of uh, communities that we we serve. Accessible playground. Obviously, we want to make sure that all of our playground and all of our features in our parks are accessible to all. Uh, picnic grove, water features, outdoor exercises, and group education areas kind of round out the rest of that list. Any questions on that real quick or any thoughts that anybody has? Again, this is open conversation. Any questions along the way, please, please ask. So the next thing is what additional thoughts or comments would you like to share about the park? Again, we had about 453 people respond to this and by and large, the trees, the natural shade, and the place to rest rated 38% of the respondents. And I think that's pretty easy to see because one of the great things about the site is that it's heavily wooded. There's a lot of great natural trees. The, the heritage oak is, is one that we're particularly interested in and using that as a focal point. But there's a pretty decent amount of, of cover or shade that is an asset to the park that we want to take advantage of. Sports courts again, rated up there 23%. <clears throat> and again, you're starting to see a theme here, right? Walkability, minimal parking, uh, parking and traffic concerns, that's, that's something that's new that we just saw in the, in the survey, I think. When we look at the development of this, one of the things that we need to be careful of is parking and access. How much parking do we need? Where is it gonna be located? How is it gonna impact the existing vegetation? All of those things we need to weigh and, and flush out. Also, from a storm water standpoint, how do you integrate storm water uh, management into this as well? and also not impact some of the existing vegetation. So parking and all of that is gonna be really important. Universal appeal equipment, again, this is just allowing all ages to be able to participate in the parks program. Open space passive, that was 8%. I was a little surprised about that being as low as it was considering the, the, the existing context of the site. I figured that would have been a little bit higher um, actually in the survey, dog friendly and no sports at all, which was 
There are a lot of other opportunities where people wrote in some comments. So they talked about this park, making sure that we recognize the fact that it's a gateway into the community, and I, we would agree with that. So how does that sort of sit on that corner of 88th and, and 67th and become that sort of welcome gateway into the neighborhood is also going to be important. I think, uh, again, the idea of, of nature and really playing up the idea of connecting with nature is, is something that's not lost on us, and it's, been, again, a very common theme throughout the rest of uh, this survey. Um, they had talked about courts, again, basketball versus pickleball versus other picnic areas. Uh, again, those are, those are conversations that we'd like to have and flush those out with you all. And then, again, uh, accessibility. Uh, accessibility concerns to making sure that this park is accessible for all. Um, the next ones get into more of the demographics, just kind of understanding where people are as far as uh, do they live in the community, if they do live in the community, um, you know, what is their gender, what is their age group, that helps us to kind of understand who might be using this park more than others. It doesn't mean that that's the determining factor of how we're going to program this thing, but it's an idea for us to kind of see how the usage is going to be across all the demographics in, a, in an effort to balance out the program as much as possible. So these diagram, uh, these uh, uh, questions right here got to that where, do you live within the village? 77%, the vast majority of the respondents uh, said yes. Uh, from a gender standpoint, 62% uh, women responded. That's pretty typical from our experience. Uh, We're the ones that answered the survey. Yeah, that, you are, that's true. Um, zip code, so 33156 is, is your zip code, vast majority, almost uh, 78, 79%. Uh, Kendall, I think, is, is the next one, and South Miami is, is the last. Um, demographics, you can see that from the respondents that we have, again, this is 925 respondents to this question, 54% fall within the 45 to 64 age bracket as far as uh, intended uses. Uh, the next highest one is 25 to 44 followed by 65 to 74, and then 15 to 24. Um, you still have some zero to nine and some 10 to 14. But again, what's important about this one is just kind of understanding again, who all might be using this and how making sure that we have program for everybody that might attend, right? Again, making that accessible for everybody. Household income, uh, and then just your ethnic, again, this is just background information just to try to understand who's answering the questions. Uh, a lot of this information uh, really doesn't apply to how we're gonna develop this. It's just more just trying to understand people's perspectives. So, the survey takeaways. Residents wanted pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, parks located at the busy intersections, the respondents want a safe and non-motorized way to get to the park. We, we would agree, that the, and we'll get to when we get to some of the site analysis, but the intersection of uh, 88th and 67th is going to be really important of how you make a safe crossing at that point and then have a very intuitive circulation pattern right into the park. So that's from a, a non-motorized opportunity. There's also other opportunities to create some secondary gateways to allow people to come from multiple uh, directions into the park. But the, the way that we handle that intersection is going to be key. Respondents say uh, want some parking to be provided, but it should not be. Uh, it should be minimal and screened in view. Again, parking is going to be a tricky one here. There's you just. Believe a, it, I couldn't even park here. I hope it's not going to happen the same thing that just happened to me here. I had park across the street and I live like two blocks away from this place and it's there's no space so you know you haven't even addressed the, uh, the parking parkway the no it's true okay yeah I'm the big bad wolf and you all are a little red light so parking Yes, parking. You didn't even address parking last time with the Pinecrest Parkway. But this isn't Pinecrest Parkway. Yeah, but it's similar because it's all connected to Gulliver and everything. So, you know, you know. Okay, go ahead. And I'm obviously the only one here. Parking, like in most conditions in the urban areas, is going to be very key. So what we, again, what we need to do is determine what's the right amount of parking for this park, right? How many people are going to be... Uh, you know, walking within a within a five or ten minute radius versus how many people might be biking, 
versus how many people may be uh, driving to this park. I mean, so my mile radius, not walking of time, mile. Blocks. No, a 10 minute walk is technically. But yeah. I would like to know as far as yeah. blocks, not just, you know, 10 minutes. A quarter blocks. of a mile or half a yeah, mile. Coming over from across a, the street a, over there from Dayland Apartments. So, so, uh, so parking is going to be key. And again, how parking is going to be integrated into the site is really going to be a challenge. Again, we want to minimize the impact of hard surfaces to really preserve the natural quality of the trees. And so there's going to be a a balancing act with that and that's going to be it's going to be a tough one and i think we can solve it but it's going to require some some some, some really creative thinking to solve those, some those issues approval. yes may i add something else um besides from parking you also have to consider because me i live on 65th floor which is right in the right across. Yep. and we are suffering from people um not finding parking on uh Gulliver. So the misuse of parking, that will be another situation. Because it will be very convenient for them to park in the park, right. to go and drop it off, or drop the kids off, and then come back and use the park. And the misuse of the park is another situation that you have to consider. Good point. Good point. I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, so can you answer the question on the 65th floor where the direct neighbor abutting the park? Um, so the parking definitely affects us. and. Even the freebie cars that are provided and subsidized by the village use 65th Court as an idling cul-de-sac um, all day, every day, um, while they wait for ride share. And um, I've always wondered, we've only, we closed on our house August 8th, so we've been there just about a month. Um, <coughs> our initial question, especially for the park, is whether Gulliver would be amenable to sharing some parking with the park on the weekend. That's a, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Share parking is a great way to kind of help distribute parking, especially at high needs. Especially if there's an event happening there, that's, that's a great way to do it. Especially, I think if we're able to have an agreement or work on an agreement with, with the school to do that, that would really help, I think, the development of the park and preserve a lot of the... Right, and I think everybody will win because I don't put it past Gulliver, since it's the upper school and their teenagers hanging out at the park immediately after school. I, I, I'm sure that's a problem to come for me. I literally abut the park, so I'm just assuming teenagers getting out of sports, parents will be able to meet me in the park instead. Um, all of our frustrations, I mean, we just bought in on 65th Court, so I saw the issue when I decided to live there. Um, but I am also thinking of ways to mitigate and have everybody be happy because I have a two-year-old, I have another one too next week. I plan to use the park too. I want the park, you know? Right. No, I think your, your concerns are, are valid and we can, we can gonna do best as property. possible address that from a design standpoint. I think there's an overlap of a policy which is outside of our purview that I think would also need to be implemented. Okay. In driving down here to the meeting tonight, I passed by the intersection that, that we're t all talking about. And I wondered, what was the construction across the street, I guess north, uh, near the church? School, what is that going to be? That's church and school. That's the church and school. That's what I'm going to ask It appears to be in the church property, but there's a lot of construction, so my question is, what is it intended to be in the future? It's going to be Gullard. No, no, I don't have that question. Yeah, so that, that property there, if I can have your attention, please. That property is, it's Gulliver's property. They're, they're still developing. They were developing a sports field um, that I believe they finished. I'm not 100% sure. And then the church, they swapped properties, if I remember correctly. And the, the church property was being uh, redeveloped. And, and the church is built, developing there on the, corner. On the, on the opposite. Yes. So it's not a parking garage, I assure you. That's not what the zone uh, change said. Because but I'm telling you it's not working rush. But it's been approved. I went in front of the mayor and yeah. Anna. And but we're not here about that property approved. right now. I know, but it's directly linked and it's going to impact. It's, you know, I even heard about a overpass linking right. the park to Gulliver and this and that and the lighting and the traffic. It's right. really, but, I but grew if up I can, in that neighborhood and it, two blocks away and I right. so, uh, we used to own part of Gulliver Prep on the contrary. If right. anybody knows, and I still live across but let the us, street. But let us but remember. No. 
there's no parking there. It's a really dangerous intersection unless you're planning on buying out everybody eventually surrounding you. He said, I'm just like really uh, surprised that here you are, you know, with the analysis and you don't know anything about Gulliver. And it was all approved. I went and, you know, tried to, you know, find out and nobody could tell me any answers. Anything is like a big secret mystery about exactly. And it's been approved. I have actually I found them yesterday, the paper with their all email them to you if you want. And you can, you know, photocopy you or whatever because it says there quite clearly three uh, uh, parking garage approved, approved. Everything's been approved for the expansion of Gulliver. I will say though that our, our analysis is incomplete. We're just starting our analysis, so that information is new to us. Rob and I will talk about that and see how that impacts us. Our, 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 initial in, our initial process was to engage the community with this survey, and that's what today is, is about. So, real quickly, we have started some analysis, but it's very cursory at this point, just to provide a, a broad overview to everybody of what this project is about, right? So, obviously, we're talking about Gary Madison Park, which is located right here, I can't see it. Which, which is I roughly see it three again. acres in size. I can't see. I live two blocks away, and I'm being directly impacted. This concerns me. Maybe not many people here, but I can't see. Can you zoom out so that I can see? The, the, the park is right here. Yeah, I know where it is. I'm two blocks away from it, but can you make the park very big? That's as big as this goes. Sorry. 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 So this, this park space has been identified in a couple uh, master plans that the city has commissioned over the years. First, in the comprehensive development of 2016. It was also uh, mentioned in the transportation master plan of 2018, and most recently in the parks and recreation master plan of 2021. Again, a quick analysis of this. This park is roughly three acres in size. Again, the corner of 67th and 88th with the with the very major intersection uh, located there. Single family detached, uh, basically on the south and east side with multifamily to the west. The school is immediately to the north and there's opportunities for three uh, pedestrian connections uh, at the corners to, to come in and access the park, as well as there's a planned greenway trail which is gonna run uh, on the east side of 67th that we'd also tap into to provide more access, biking and walking through the larger community. <clears throat> Again, there's a lot of existing uh, trees, palms, and oaks on site. You can see there's a number of them. There's all the species there in the numbers, uh, with oak being 21. The heritage oak located right here in the middle, a nice prime uh, specimen that we definitely want to take advantage of. Again, this is an asset. This is something that we want to build on. Uh, but it also does create some uh, challenges, again, with trying to fit all the other program in here. Uh, and being mindful of where we have open space to either put courts or open uh, grass fields or parking. So, you know, there's a lot that we need to process in here and also dive into is the quality of those trees. While there's a lot on here, some of them might not be worth saving while others are. So part of our process and our evaluation is to go through that and determine which ones are best so to keep. So in other words, you're going to be tearing down all the trees like they did across the street. Uh, no, ma'am, I did not see that. Down. No, I, I did not say that we would do that. Jungle, <laughs> so when we start looking at Sorry, benchmarking at best, yes, sir. Just a question, because you were talking about the site. Is there a plan at this point for kind of sound barriers? Again, not to monopolize, just on, on the south we side have, of the property. At this point in time, we have no concepts oh, okay. developed as far as what this space wants to be. The, this, the point of this meeting is to get some more feedback from the community to, to fine tune that. Obviously, you know, from the south side, there's a, there's a really established existing strand of trees. We want to preserve that to create that buffer between uh, those homes and the sound and the views. So we, we are looking to maintain that as much as possible. Again, the existing plant material that's on site, we want to reta retain that as much as possible while still allowing for other program to, to occur. So again, there's, there's a lot of back and forth that we need to do and do some test fitting with a different program once we get to that point of finalizing that program. When we start looking at benchmarking of best practices, there's five different categories that we tend to look at. We look at identity, right? We look at how does this park want to fit into the community itself? How does it fit into the park 
character. It's very well established that there's a there's a certain look and feel about your parks. We want to make sure that we complement that and reinforce that. From an ecology standpoint, we want to make sure that we are capitalizing on that. Again, from a plant uh, community standpoint, we, we want to enhance activation. So what type of activities could we have, both active and passive? Uh, it's going to be really important to get that balance. Access, we've talked about that. That's going to be key. Is it easy to get to? Is it intuitive to get to? Both from a pedestrian and a vehicle standpoint. And maintenance. Maintenance is something that generally gets overlooked with parks. You see a lot of and the director will probably agree that sometimes you get these beautiful plans, but they become really hard to maintain. And therefore, over the course of the years, it loses its some of its, its importance. So understanding how this is going to be maintained from a sustainability standpoint is going to be really, really key. We also look at <clears throat> the larger bucket of program into three, three basic categories, which is uh, the natural, recreation, and cultural. So in natural, we've talked a lot about that with the existing tree canopies, walking paths, stormwater management, pollinated gardens as an example, recreational with pickleball, uh, passive recreation lawn, playscapes, paths, fitness equipment, right? Cultural is picnic groves, shelters, community gardens, outdoor education, water features, any place where people can kind of come together and socialize. Uh, we look at it as far as a cultural aspect. And so when we start to break these down into more specific and start looking at vehicular circulation, we, again, I made a couple of these points before, but making sure we establish a very clear circulation and wayfinding throughout the site, that it's intuitive, people aren't guessing where they're going, that it's also safe and open. People, when they walk through here, they want to feel comfortable. We don't want to have places where people can hide, right? We need to be mindful of that. We also want to make sure that, again, we're preserving uh, and, and minimizing the amount of hardscape through this space. We want to uh, optimize parking, make that as efficient as possible, and have as small as footprint as possible when it comes to parking. Planting also, uh, from a sustainable standpoint, how do we break up the sea of parking to, to have uh, less, uh, more permeable uh, ability, right? So stormwater retention, how do we do that? Green it up, soften it up. And like I mentioned again, signage and wayfinding is also a pretty critical piece in any park, large or small. <clears throat> Pedestrian circulation, again, this is, this is pretty self-explanatory, but there's a couple different ways that we can look at this, right? Uh, boardwalks, we can have uh, paved surfaces or more naturalized where there's gravel. Uh, having closed loops so that you, know, you can be able to chart your steps if you want. If there's a loop that runs through there, you know that you've walked maybe a half mile, and that's an easy way for, from an exercise standpoint. So when we look at pedestrian circulation, obviously we still want to create that clear hierarchy we want it to be safe, but we also want to also help contribute to uh, positive uh, uh, wellness. Recreation, best practices, right? Again, this covers the spectrum of both passive and active, right? So open lawns where you can have a multitude of different events, yoga, birthday parties, throw the football, be informal, right? Versus where we have courts uh, and also play structures. Uh, also fitness stations. So again, from an activation standpoint or recreation standpoint, there's a bunch of different things that we're looking at to try to find the right balance of how do we, how do we provide a lot of program for everybody, but also a variety of, of, of experiences. Play areas, play areas, there's a lot of great uh, ideas out uh, in the, in our profession now when it comes to play areas, right, where we have some more customized uh, play structures that really kind of elevate the, the, the idea of structured play. A lot of your parks have some of these structures. Nature play is really big where you're trying to capitalize on the idea of, of having kids connect with nature while they play. It's also a learning opportunity for them. You can see in these two photos right here, there's opportunities that this one's more of a wet play versus a dry play. And then a little bit more of a themed or, or introducing art and play uh, as well. There's a lot of fun things we can do with play to help energize, uh, energize kids and make kids connect uh, instead of just a swing or, or a slide, right? There's a lot more that we can do. And so here's some, a few more ideas of how we can kind of really expand upon the idea of play, uh, customize pieces that kind of fit more into the context of the site, take advantage of some of those existing trees, maybe get kids up into the canopy. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I was always climbing the trees. I don't see a lot of kids doing that anymore. So how do we kind of get back because to that? Because all the trees have been torn down for concrete jungles like this. 
more examples of nature play. Again, just trying to get kids to experience a different type of play. And then again, also there's great examples of more uh, off-the-shelf structures that we can do that have a little bit more feel and character to them instead of the run-of-the-mill sort of swing and slide. Water features. Now this is something that you know some, some folks like, some don't. There's obviously trade-offs when it comes to water features. There's definitely a positive as far as kids playing in that. I, I'm sure you've all seen pop jets. As soon as a kid sees that, they go a beeline towards that. So it's really popular. Um, also, some of the smaller, more intricate ones where they're kind of introduced white sound, that's also a nice feature. Uh, whether it's more contemporary or traditional. Mist, uh, misting features are pretty popular because uh, the initial cost is relatively cheap, the maintenance of that's relatively cheap, but it also allows the kids to play it without getting soaked, and it also kind of helps create a microclimate to keep things cool in the park as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of benefits when it comes to the mist. It's like a cookie cutter. Uh, park shelters, again, here we want to see if we can take a look at you know, a fresh take to, instead of just providing a gazebo, is there other type of structure that we do? whether it's a variety of, of, of picnic tables with umbrellas or a more sort of uh, standalone structure piece, or we start looking at creating more opportunities to have um, a different experience. So if there's a group saying, hanging out with this, another group can hang out in there and they don't feel like they're intruding on a, on a party. A lot of things, that, a lot of times when you go to a, a public space and you have a gazebo, people are less likely to use that if somebody's already in there. So if there's, a, if there's a way that we could try to help, you know, provide more opportunity from a, stru uh, from a structure standpoint. Also like the image that we showed over there, again, the, the idea of four seasons. How can we extend that and make that more comfortable year round? Uh, stormwater management, uh, I touched on this real briefly again, but the idea of, of how do we capture uh, stormwater in a very um, efficient way and manage that in a way that it's not intrusive to the park, right? I think uh, I was down here by two months ago, there was a huge rain and everything was soaked and there's puddles everywhere. And that's a reality that we have living in Florida so close to the sea level. But so how do we control that better so that our parks are more usable? Uh, how can we do that to promote sustainability uh, and, 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 green, and green infrastructure? Community gardens, again, we touched on this a little bit earlier. You saw this as one of the uh, items that a lot of people responded well to. There's multiple ways that we can do community gardens. It could be vegetable gardens. We could, we could set aside small plots where people can go and manage it themselves. We could provide uh, planters where people can grow not only vegetables, but also maybe flowers or anything along those lines. So there's a, a couple different ways we can handle community gardens. And again, they're quite popular. And so uh, that is all that I have real quick. Um, so our next, our, our next steps in this process is to hear more about what you all have to say, take that information, and begin to formalize and create three concepts that we will be working with the director and the village, ultimately going to council and putting our recommendation of what that plan would be. So that would be another opportunity from the public standpoint to comment on the development of the park. Um, so, with that, I'll open it up if there's any comments, questions. Yes? I have a question. I mean, everything looks really nice, and we're going back to pickleball. Um, <laughs> pickleball is a big recreational sport, and if anybody goes to Sunnyland, they will notice yes, a lot yes. of us there. However, it gets very hot, and we've had people with heat stroke. And it would be nice to have a little cover for people to go under when they're waiting for a game than just out in the open. But I don't see any of that in a plan that you've mentioned. Uh, we haven't shown that, not because we, we, we wouldn't do that. It's because we don't have a plan yet. But I would say that the idea of providing shade in those in structures is really important. And I think you bring up a good point that uh, especially with the ports being as open they are, we do want to provide shade and comfort for them. Also, probably water yeah, and water. opportunities for people to hydrate. So, and restrooms. So, uh, we we haven't we haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> but that would be part of the program. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Um, I wanted to comment about pickleball or basketball in a small neighborhood park like that. 
typically for pickleball, I'm going to guess, we don't play, but you're going to have four people on a single court playing at the same time, may arri maybe arriving in four cars. The next group wants to arrive maybe in other four cars. Uh, it just looks like we would be overloaded. Same thing with basketball. I used to play basketball in a court. We'd show up in different cars, uh, and you'd have <laughs> ten guys out on a court playing. Uh, creates a lot more automobile traffic than for a small area like that. Is there is that a question or, or a comment? It's, it's an observation for you to consider. I just yes. You know. uh, honestly, uh, when we look at this program, there's considerations as far as who's using it, where they're coming from. So all that's going to be taken into account as we flush this out. Yes, in the back. Uh, first of all, in the audience right here, I don't see anybody who worked with us on limiting the enrollment and parking at Gulliver. We kind of put together a group of homeowners going all the way down to Beth Arm, all the way up to 67th Avenue, and then around our area where it's the Swan Lake and Sutton Place and all those apartments right there, where we lobbied the, the village council and, and worked diligently with Gulliver to limit their enrollment. And we got them to limit their enrollment and take all their parking off of the streets because I don't know where you all live, but on the corner of Kendall and 67th at 8 o'clock in the morning, with the exception of maybe two months out of the year, the traffic is horrible. And, and, uh, and we, we appreciate the, the vigor of the pickleball, the pickleball players. Uh, uh, but uh, there's, there's no room on that, on that footprint for a lot of parking. Uh, I'm sure none of you have actually you know, met the late federal magistrate who owned that property, uh, made the staff <laughs> in the village there. And uh, we used to, he used to invite us over to, and give us all of his mangoes. And he, 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 in a conversation, he said, when I'm gone and I pass this on, I don't want to see a bunch of um, mango mansions built here. I, like, I want to give something maybe to, to the county back then or, or the village now with, uh, with, with people being able to, to walk to, to, the, to the park, not, not drive there, uh, mm -hmm. and, and not cause more traffic, traffic issues than we have right now. And, 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 uh, and I, I appreciate this because pickleball is, is a, a really up and coming sport, mostly for people my age. But, uh, the, the traffic issue is going to be tremendous. And, uh, and when we have to put that group together uh, to, to lobby the, the village council, we'll do that. And we'll spend money on attorney's fees we have. Because we cannot stand any more traffic con congestion in that part of the part And it's of the dangerous, village. too. Mm -hmm. Quite dangerous. Hi, I'm also part of the Swan Lake uh, community. And um, my concern, it, it's a, if you haven't had a chance to go by and see the property, you should do yourself a favor. Uh, that uh, live oak tree is one of the nicest ones I've ever seen in the area. And I've lived in Pinecrest for over 40 years. Uh, my concern is the parking. Um, whatever they do, they're going to have to figure out the parking. Uh, and I, I love pickleball players. Uh, some of my best friends are here. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have to think about the rest of the community. Um, I don't know, a lot of the pickleball players probably play in different parts of uh, the area. And I know that there's a lot of pickleball players that go to Salvador Park and the Gables. Um, I don't know, last year I went to a funeral at St. Philip's Episcopal Church that was at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I couldn't find a parking place. But right across from the church is Salvador Park, and there were all these pickleball courts open. The people were playing on them, and then the tennis courts. There are only two courts yeah. at Salvador Park. Well, but they were busy. It's, it's a very busy park. But my point is that now I have friends that go to that church. They have had to hire valet parking on Sunday morning so that parishioners can find a place to park to go to church. Mm -hmm. And you know the property that we're talking about right in front of us is only what a little over three acres. Yeah. How are you going to put in all this horse equipment or whatever and still have a place to park the cars? That's all I'm saying. 
And I think um, to, to address that um, real quick, so we, we share the same concern with regards to parking. Uh, so like there's no, there's no drama about, about it. So there's no, we share that concern and trying to find that balance of, of providing the opportunities, whether it's pickleball, whether it's just a playground, whether it's a passive park. Um, finding that balance of making sure that people can get to it, can park in there. We're hoping that a lot of people in the community, Matt had mentioned a number of walking access points as well, riding bikes and things like that, that we really want to encourage. So if we're limiting the number of parking spaces, that's okay. We're also op providing opportunity for people to come in with other modes of transportation, um, which for a community of our size, especially if we're looking to build uh, you know, 10 minute walks to your parks, that's something that we're really hoping we can do more and more of and limit some of that. Now, I'm not gonna say that, that there won't ever be you know, uh, a bunch of cars in the parking lot, but you have to remember too, when you're looking at Gulliver, you're looking at an entire school with hundreds of kids or more. With, we're looking at a park with pickleball. If we have four courts, we have 16 people, and, and that's not gonna give the same amount of traffic as what you would if, if we have hundreds of people coming into one park at the same time. So we're trying to find that balance. We wanna keep it light. We wanna be respectful to the neighborhood because obviously you have to live there and, and we wanna be good neighbors. We wanna make sure that what we're doing is gonna be right, not just for the people who live around in the, in the park there, but also the entire community. So we do wanna address the parking. This is something that, that Matt, has, Matt and I both have discussed uh, a number of times we know it's going to be a really big concern and we want to get it right. So we're we, I'm really glad that you're bringing it up. It's something that we need to continue to be uh, reminded of and we'll, we'll take it from there. But we really are trying to find that right balance with, with everything. I'm going to go real back. So she just uh, came up real quick and then we'll come back. So I just want to say, I'm speaking for myself, but on behalf of the community and pickleball it just got popular this is as far as I'm concerned a trend it has not been proven to be a sport like basketball or tennis and the proposition of dedicated court um, investing in such a three acre park dedicated courts that don't have versatility to be something else when you know, in the pandemic, we were baking bread. Now we don't do it. <laughs> that this, yeah. I don't. I just don't see how that is. Um, that is savvy on the part of the village to invest in exclusive pickleball courts, given where we are in the trend. Yes. So I can I can actually address that. Pickleball's been around for decades. Oh, um, I know it's and, been around. And, it just hasn't been popular. Well, no, no. So uh, I would I would venture to say that it actually has over the last 15 years, especially it's been um, the most popular growing sport um, in the nation. Uh, I don't is, doubt the growth. Yeah. I'm saying we're probably at the peak, just like the property value. I, that I can't Things say when the peak is. Right, I can't say when the peak is. That'll, that'll, but I'm saying that it's, it's, only, yeah. three it's yeah. only three acres. It's only three acres, and the community has other priorities. The community has developed other parts in the last 15 years and not prioritized pickle walls. So you guys were observing the trend, you didn't hop on it. And now you choose to do so right now. I didn't say you couldn't have, or my opinion is not that we cannot have it. Right. I'm saying let's stay diverse. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Here. One, one, on this, I agree. Yeah. You create this more environmental or green and be creative. You know, don't create a parking lot. Just, you know, uh, do the, op the opposite. Bring uh, 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 green cards to bring people to, to the court instead of you know, encouraging people yeah. to. That's you something that we've. I've I mean, I mean, I mean, been trying to tell the people from Gulliver, bringing the kids in, in uh, 
uh, on, on green cars or you know uh, or something else, but ride you know ride in a bike, you know like they do in Europe. So I mean, um, I mean, you don't have to create the the, the, the parking. Mm -hmm. so, Hi, um, I just have a quick question. What is the footprint and the amount of land that Don Cipricel is on versus what? this new Pinecrest garden, uh, Pinecrest is, because that's a huge park and that can take a lot of other things, yet it's very pedestrian, um, it's very kid-friendly, they have tennis courts, they have more than enough parking, and it appears to me that our park is going to be a lot smaller. Yeah, I'm not 100% not sure uh, exactly how big Dante Facel is. Uh, it's 25 acres? 2.7. Oh, 7 acres. I'm sorry. It's, it's 7 acres. So we've got to have about half. We have less than half. We have a third. No, actually, the park, the master is 3.76, just to be clear. It's not 3. It's almost Right. Large. Yeah. Almost large. And I would say, just a, sorry, I have a head up. My name is Charlie Bibb. Pinecrest does has done a phenomenal job of of creating all of this activity for all kinds of special interests. If we look out here, we've got soccer. We look around, we got baseball. Sunday has got baseball, football, uh, basketball. The community center has. We have a Flagler Grove, which has lacrosse. So it's not unreasonable to think we would dedicate a space to a very very underserved population and try to do it in a way that. You, as a resident, you know, abutting the park can be happy, and we, as the community at large that embraces this sport, also be happy. But that's not passive. That's the point. It was marked yeah. as passive. And on three acres, how many courts? Three point seven six acres. Pardon? Three point seven six. On three point seven six acres, how many courts plus? Parking lot, can you that's fit? And still, has to do. there, nice. but it's not really that scientific. I'm a lawyer, and I can tell you that by the time you put four dedicated courts and a parking lot for 20 vehicles, it's no longer green. If that's the reality of what it's going to be, then speak the truth. Yeah. But I'm saying if the objective, and you know, we care about the canopy, preserving the, the oak in the center, and all of those things remain true as the tenets of what underlie Matzner Park then the answer is that you will not get as many pickleball courts as you guys want. That is the, the answer that it needs oh, to be. So I can actually help you out with that information. So well, you know, one second. That. If I can give you some, hatch. I can give you the, the so have you been to um, Coral Pine Park? Just yes. to put it into perspective, you can fit two pickleball courts on one tennis court. Four. So, four. but what is that? Well, you can get two four. Well, you can go, <laughs> right. but you can do four, but, but, Looking at what we're doing right now, so you can either fit six or twelve pickleball courts on one of the three section of courts that we have. So you've got we've got two section of three courts in Coral Pine Park, and you can fit six really comfortably. Or if you want to tighten everything up, you can fit twelve courts on that one Coral section Pine is of space. Than Asner, no, but you're asking about square footed size. or the size wise. The size, well, but and location. No, no, that no location. but just to confirm, is Coral Pine bigger than Madison? Yes. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. We have to look at it as a percentage of the whole mm -hmm. and look at the park from that perspective. Yeah. What is the objective of the park? So for me, transparency, I mean, maybe I just ground it in, in words and truth or whatever as an attorney, but I'm just curious, what is the goal here? And then I think I can have a more productive conversation. But that's what we're here for. That's what we're here to get that feedback right now. I, I think your yeah. feedback is really important to hear yeah. both both sides of the argument, and I don't want to focus just on pickleball because I don't think that's that's. Well, it dominated the survey, so I'm not going it, to it pretend that it's not going to. We're going to have the courts. That's I know. true, but this process when we start to get into the the concepts, it's going to be a push. It's going to be. Should be incremental. It's going to be looking at all these different factors. All right, what happens if we do have pickleball? What's the right number? What's the parking requirement going to be for that? What's the parking requirement for our playground? With the, all these things we're taking into account, and we're going to test, like I like to call it test fit. Does it fit? And, and does it keep to 
our goals and objectives of the park of preserving as much of the natural character as possible. If it doesn't, we'll throw it out. And I, I will be very clear and honest with the director said, this is not the right path to go and provide another option. I'm not there yet. I don't have enough information to be able to sit here and tell you it's going to be A or B at this point in time. That's part of our design process. It's a little more messy than maybe say, lawyer and text. We, we test different things out. And that's what we're gonna get into next. So the information that we get here tonight to hear the importance of parking, to hear the importance of how pickleball fits or doesn't fit is really important for us to, to weigh these decisions. I'm sorry, yeah, there's a lot. Okay, um, I'm okay with pickleball. But uh, I do like, I do think it's important to have at least one park in our village that is soft surface and that you can walk on it like the Dante Pazza has a, like the little wood chips or something that is natural, softer on people who are recovering from ailments <laughs> and softer for people who want to walk longer distances that it's not pounding the pavement. And you, you sort of brought it up but then you, in, in the selection of uh, natural spaces to walk, yeah. But um, I just wanted to know if that's something that, because none of our parks have, they're all concrete walking. Mm -hmm. And it's super uncomfortable for anybody recovering for anybody or anybody getting older. It's just a different version of natural, and I just wanted to put it out there that it would be nice if one of our parks had that. I think the person, as far as experiences and types of materials, as long as it's able to be maintained, makes parks great. It provides different opportunities for people to experience it. So. If we have a nice mix of concrete versus asphalt versus gravel, we're going to propose that, right? We're going to do that in a way that makes a lot of sense for, for everybody. Again, I don't have a solution to that just yet, but if we can make that work and have that be viable long term, we'll definitely suggest that. Yes, ma'am. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, the size of the park you're mentioning, I think is probably the gross size, the gross acreage, which means it measures out into the middle of Kendall Drive and the middle of Ludlam. So it's actually smaller than 3.76. So it's not even 3.76. But my um, other question is, if there's courts and things like this, will that require some sort of an office or, I don't know, do people pay to play on pickleball courts or are they just open? I don't know, but would that be requiring an office where somebody has no. to, there's no. staff there no. for activities or just? Right, I mean, that's, that's uh, not something that we have, have been interested in putting on there. Um, if we did anything whatsoever, it would be a very small one room area, very much like uh, I was familiar with um, the office and restroom area at um, Flagler Grove Park. So it would be something, one tiny room. It's not meant for people, it's really just meant for, for one staff member to be able to maintain the park and address things uh, if necessary. Mm -hmm. I just want to yeah. ask a question. That big uh, parkway that you see is going to go along that the uh, east side of Ludlam. When is that going to be constructed? Do you know? I heard they were going to do Kendall Drive first and then go down Ludlam. But here's an idea. No parking in the park. Because you know what? It'll force people to walk, to ride bikes, to carpool, to drop everybody off, to freebie, to whatever. So don't have parking. Yeah. It was supposed to be a passive parking now. So I live in the property of the Lawn was originally supposed to be a green passive park. Mm -hmm. My only issue is the parking and having parking spaces. I think everything else can be worked with, but parking spaces can we add to the problems that obviously you know, Oliver, they all squat out to all the other things. You know, the Russian residents, they're parking, they're always walking around. I've had kids from Gulliver walk through my property, giving me nasty notes. 
I live on London. But the parking is the, I think it's the only thing that's the real major problem. I'm question, would there be hours for the park? And would there be a, uh, a physical fence around it? In other words, could you approach? Yes. Approach upon no, 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 there would be hours to the park. So all our parks have hours regardless. There will be hours to the park. Um, and the plan will be to make sure that it's a gated park um, as well. That was something that we discussed previously. Um, the and, and then obviously enforcement outside of that when the park is closed, law enforcement patrols and and they would they would address the situation. I live on a slot lane. Mm -hmm. I want to walk across the street at 67. There'd be a fence there. I'd have to. I couldn't just go directly across the park. Right. If it was after park hours, you would not be able to walk through the park there to get to where what you were going. What are the hours? Um, so our typical park hours are 9 to 5. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Who's hour? 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 Who's hour?
kind of like water flow, also lighting, because like I said, like you look from our house, it's like literally the park is right there. And so, you know, being able to show my daughter to sleep at night, all that kind of matters. So just noise, light pollution, and kind of water overflow will be a huge thing. Also yeah. factoring into that, like, if you're going to use septic or, you know, it's going to be on the county sewer, that'd be, uh, I guess, right. Yeah. Right. So, and that, that lighting is a, is a great, <laughs> Uh, so making sure that we have uh, cutoffs on all the fixtures so there's not great light pollution into the roadway, into your yards, or uh, trying to minimize the height of pull, trying to have low lighting. Low level lighting is going to be the best way to solve that. And also direction of the lighting, right? It's Correct. Like, so right. You can drive facing backwards and it's like right into every, you know. Right. right. Yeah. We, we typically, when in parks, we try to keep our, if we have poles about 12 feet high and have cutoffs on them, that really helps manage uh, overflow of, of light pollution. Where we can, we try to have either uh, light, small tree up lights or bollard lighting. There's a trade off of that because you need more fixtures if you go bollard lighting to get the, the proper light coverage so from a safety standpoint. But those are all different things we can look at as we develop this. And I think lighting is another one that we did touch on, but that's a, that's a good point, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we Townhouses there, and they have underground parking. You know what I'm talking about? I, I see a smile. You don't have the budget. Look at it. 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 Look at when you think about their parking, they really don't have a lot of parking. It's only right in front of the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. And they have six tennis courts. So right there, if they were playing double, it would be 24 cars and along the street. And I live right behind. And once in a blue, blue moon, they will come in the back and park in the back end and on my property. But it's so rare. So they get away with it with very little parking. And the other thing about that park, obviously I'm a proponent of that park, <laughs> um, they have, somebody mentioned about uh, cement uh, walkways. They put a new installation of cushion mm -hmm. around the park, which is fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Really nice. We have five parks and not one of them has that. It's ridiculous. Yes, uh, two questions. Uh, can you go over how you're going to get our feedback with the uh, stickers on the drawings? And also, by the time you get all this feedback and this information, would you have a few or several conceptual drawings that the interest of people can see what it actually might look like? First, first question. The stickers that we have here, uh, that's if you would take these and just place these on images that you like. It's not for dislike, but if you like, that's going to help us uh, understand a uh, certain character or program. The other thing that we'll be able to do is we can uh, take photos and scan these and put them on the website that we have so we can share those back out with everybody so they can see see those results. The second part of your question was... Uh, well, you have several concepts. Yes, concepts. The information you get. We, will have, we will have three concepts that we will develop. And as I was mentioning before, we're going to take those and develop those with the director. And we'll share those with the village uh, council and at that point in time, be able to solicit feedback on the right approach for which concept uh, we need to finalize and move forward with. Okay, uh, my name is Josh Gallagher. Um, I'm a pickleball advocate and also a, a beach volleyball advocate. I'm on the um, advisory committee of Dade County Parks uh, and Recreation, which we have like 11 empty spaces. So uh, not here in that capacity, but I'm not a resident of Pinecrest, but I do support really active parks, and I think we passed a bunch of houses that had a tennis court, which we know fit about three or four pickleball courts comfortably, and no one said, wow, that's too much cement for that yard, because it's not. Yeah, a tennis court is relatively small. Um, volleyball is another sport like pickleball that builds community. It allows men and women, young and old, to play. It's a friendly and community building sport. And obviously the pickleball community has shown out and that's great. I support, uh, I'm trying to get some courts in the Grove built. Um, but, and they're next to the fire station on Oak. Phillips Park. No, they're next to the fire station on Oak, which okay. turns into Tiger Tail. Right. But we play there every day at 5.30, you're invited. With no parking. With no, no parking and we ride our scooters or bikes <laughs> or we park on the street, you know. 
and, and pay for the parking or get parking tickets. Um, <coughs> so you may or may not know that um, beach volleyball became an NCAA sport and also became an FHSA or basically a high school sport. But there's very few par um, places to play and so it's very soft um, because it's sand and it's very inviting and you know I just hope that you guys get um, the pickleball courts and I hope you guys uh, don't you know invite too many cars to disrupt the neighbors and I hope that you'll consider whether I missed your master plan process and I apologize but like I hope that you'll build beach volleyball courts somewhere because in a tennis court you can build about square footage wise a couple volleyball courts which would also build so like in the size of two tennis courts on this park which is two tennis courts in a park is not like oh to me then you could put four pickleball and two beach volleyball and you know young ladies need a place and young men need a place, place to play if they're going to train to get these scholarships and so i hope you'll consider that um, in your master plan or your other parks and i know we have lots of baseball fields that support all the sports because when we play sports it keeps us healthy then we don't need to call the ambulance so we really need to think about fire and police and parks equally in terms of our health if we think more broadly so I'm glad to see such a big group out here um, supporting their parks, but John, I just want to say that. How, how much parking is at Kennedy Park? Not enough. No, but <laughs> not much. Not Wait, enough. But, but, but the thing that we did at Kennedy Park in, in City of Miami, Coconut Grove, is they did put lights. So the most expensive thing that your tax dollars are going to go to is the land. It's not what you put on the land. It's not the parking or this water or mister or court. It's going to be the land, which is very expensive. And so my, I would encourage you guys to keep it open because unfortunately we have to go in November through daylight savings time or the opposite and it gets dark and no one can play and do anything healthy Monday through Friday anymore and it really severely limits your healthy options so you're forced into the dark on the couch watching TV rather than being out with your friends playing sports. So I would just, I, I would like to see more, like no one gets offended when they see six tennis courts with lights or ba huge baseball fields with lights or soccer fields and so I, I would like to see lights on on beach volleyball courts and on pickleball courts as well just not not just dedicated pickleball courts or volleyball courts but also lights for them be at a reason and shut off at a reasonable hour and, and at Kenny they have one that goes straight down if you're 10 steps away you're in total darkness and they go off if no one's using them you have to push the button to enact them so that the light is not just automatically on every night it's only if they're getting used so I just support active partners. Good Thank point. you. Good point. Good point. My name is Cynthia Seymour. I am a Pinecrest resident. I actually live a block away from the park. I've got a landscape architecture background and I have served Commissioner Russell in the city of Miami for the past six years. I run the Coconut Grove bid. So I've worked extensively with Josh and various sports related um, enthusiasts, if you will, mm -hmm. but also within all the parks in the District 2 area, including Kennedy Park. We had a lot of concerns about the changes of the lighting along Kennedy Park because of the, the volleyball parks, or volleyball courts. And what we found was we put turtle lights in and we also put the soft um, kind of flexipave, but it's a permeable flexipave mm -hmm. as a um, it's light on there. as a walking path around. And so we were able to find a lot of solutions that didn't impact greatly the adjacent mm -hmm. residents, but also allow for and there's there is very little parking, and those parks are packed. So. No parking doesn't necessarily mean the parks aren't going to be used. We'll put it that way. I'm sorry. The, other thing is that the residents did come and oppose the lighting at Kennedy Park for the volleyball courts, but since then they've come to me and say, "You don't cause any problems. We we shouldn't have opposed you." And so I do understand that it's very disconcerting to see things go ne up next to your house and you're thinking all the worst things are going to happen. And sometimes things do happen that you don't like. I just I just want to give that feedback because we added those three years ago and they've been very popular. That <laughs> yes, I do. I do. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yes. Yes. Two, three, four, three. Sure. 
I came here to promote pickleball. Okay. Um, I have no. I live in Pinecrest. I really have nowhere to play. I go to Broward County a lot. Um, I travel a lot to California. They have converted tennis courts everywhere for older people to be playing pickleball. So I understand the issues here. It may not work at this park, but when and where can we get pickleball courts mm -hmm. converted from tennis courts? I believe the ratio is four to one in Pinecrest. Mm -hmm. So I came here to plant the seed with park people. Right, thank you. I don't have an answer for you. Okay. <laughs> I know that we worked with Westminster this summer. Um, it's getting ready to be an Olympic sport pickleball. CBS had its first televised tournament, if any of you saw it, and it was two 20-year-olds who won. FSU already has it, and it's getting implemented that once the schools get it, certified that there's going to be scholarships. So pickleball is not going away. Not just for the elderly sector, but also for the younger ones. And we've met with Westminster. They listen to us. They are putting in and starting in elementary school a pickleball program. So it is not going away. And that will be up and running by I think December so it's growing and we talked and I know a lot of you know Debbie <laughs> Debbie and I worked with Rob over there and he saw the growing need for these young kids to get into pickleball yeah. Yeah. Coral, Pine already, Coral Pine already has the lights I'm sorry Coral Pine already has the lights so why not yeah so why not take two, one quart and make, I don't know how many you make out of them, but two. Three or four. Two. 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 Three or so, four. So, and convert, well, at least start there. I mean, they, they really have, they're not served. I mean, I'm not a player, but I would love to play. I'm a soccer player personally. But, I mean, at least get them something that's reasonable. I mean, they do live in the community and, and, and pickleball is growing. And maybe convert one quart to start with that and, and start to appease people. Because I do think that three acres is pretty small to put everything that we're trying to put into it. So you have to find other solutions. I mean, you know, it's going to be difficult. So I want to ask um, everybody, I know we've had a lot of talk about pickleball. We've had a lot of talk about the parking. Those are both very important subjects, obviously. That's why a lot of people are here tonight. But what else, what other interests do you have in this park? We want to see nature. We want to see picnic areas or what what are your what are your passions for other than other than those two things and you can still talk about those things but you know I know that, that those are predominantly what's happening tonight at the meeting but is there something else that you would like to see at this park that, that we can make sure we do hear about as well? Red <coughs> excuse me. I live in the neighborhood, I grew up in the neighborhood. It's a great idea that you all want pick a ball, uh, pick a ball whatever the heck it's called. Uh, never heard of it until now, you know, with this park thing. Um, I suggest that you make the park over here, for example, th where there's a lot of space. Bottom line, it's all about location, location, location. Three acres are in that corner, and I used to know Judge Palermo personally, you know, who was the owner of the property. Uh, seems to me rather small. What was first uh, suggested was a passive park, and all of a sudden now it's become an active park, all concrete. You're going to tear down all the trees like they did across the street in Gulliver, even put a cross bridge, I heard a rumor from them. Uh, in other words, that's a, I live two blocks away. Do any of you live right there in the neighborhood? Yes. Okay. Well, I grew up in that neighborhood, and that corner is becoming increasingly, increasingly dangerous. On that intersection of Ludlam with North Kendall Drive, you all are laughing because you all don't live there. You know, so I would appreciate it that if you would at least listen to my concern, which is the traffic impact, traffic analysis. It's a really dangerous corner. People are speeding through that intersection, running red lights, pedestrians walking, crossing over. You're going to see a lot of people, God forbid, getting in accidents, getting
getting injured, but obviously to a lot of you, that doesn't concern me because you all don't live there, but I witness it on a daily basis. I would suggest that you, like the person back there said, find another location. Why, why don't you build the racquetball courts or whatever the heck they're called back in there? I'm all for sports. I'm all for sports and I'm a proponent of, you know, but I would suggest that you can I have, or can I have your, huh? can I have everyone just that's a really dangerous corner that's a really dangerous corner and we're opening up a can of worms we're not here for debate yeah we're, we're here, here to, for here traffic for analysis all, all the and back. safety the safety concerns and you are um, not addressing that you're not addressing the safety we, we, we only have a few more minutes traffic. Uh, in the meeting I want to make sure everyone has enough time to talk all the way in the back did you have a question in the back I reset yeah. You all are going for this. Yeah. Coming from the youth of Pinecrest, um, we really like our parks and going there and uh, being with friends and interacting with nature and even just playing sports there. And I really think it's a good idea to have uh, what you see at Sunday, where there's a pickleball court and a basketball court. Uh, kind of joint so that it gives opportunities for the youth to participate in basketball, but there's also the option to play pickleball. Um, to add on to what Evan said, and he actually goes to go over the town to see across the street from the park. And for almost every other park in Pinecrest has tennis courts, along with two private tennis court clubs in the area. It looks like the pickleball community has really shown out today to mm -hmm. speak on the topic. I really do think it's important to put at least one solo pickleball court, or probably more like four. <laughs> like, I, I play tennis and I play pickleball with my dad on the weekends. I think it's a lovely sport, it's a lot of fun. And it's a great way to meet new people, but if you put it in a parking lot, it's not gonna happen. If you put it on a basketball court, it happens on the weekends for two hours. If you put it on a tennis court, you know, you're really chopping off the, the time you can go. I, I think, I really do think it's important to show the community that you guys care and that you guys are looking out for us and you guys should really put some pickleball for us. <laughs> park um, but also maybe a little splash pad to make it a little more year-round like how we have in Pinecrest Gardens. A splash pad would be nice. And the, the, can you just repeat the first one that you had mentioned? The, the one tree. with the tree, the with, image with the of the tree. The I don't think we have that and I bet after pickleball people will go to the splash pad. <laughs> yes! So, yeah, that's a really because good point, actually. they're all over at CBS, or they're yeah. at Moss, or at Thursday so, King, Trader Joe's, they're all over the place. Right, no, that's a and really, that's a really good point, the homeless population. Um, we, you, the same way, I, mean, I was going to answer your question. So, the, we're going to maintain the homeless population um, the, the same way we do in, in all of our parks. Um, we, we, you know, we address um, issues if, if something illegal is happening. Um, otherwise, we, we will welcome anybody to come and visit our parks. Um, we don't have we don't have um, an issue with uh, the homeless population uh, doing illicit or illegal things in our parks. We try and address it at any time. We don't need to get rid of people. The parks are open to the public. To the homeless. To everybody. Yes. One more. For parking, and I think there's, you know, in a lot of places in this community, we prioritize cars over people and activities, and it's just, and there's a ways. I understand the properties across the street are um, privately controlled, but if you could do something cooperative with these. Things. There's plenty of parking. It's a school and a church across the street. There. I know they're remodeling the whole thing, but 
there's plenty of parking there at hours when those are not typically being used for parking. Because those are like eight to eight to four or something like that. People are usually going to be using those during the evening. So, anyways, there's there's a lot of parking in the area. We shouldn't let the need to have you know so many parking spaces control whether or not we have the activity. And I do live a couple blocks away, so. <laughs> we do live in the neighborhood, so don't worry. I will enjoy the park, and we're my gonna, children will enjoy it. We're going to wrap the up this portion of the porch. One second before you go anywhere. It's really, this next part is really important. Um, we're going to wrap up this portion of, of our discussion. I, I'm going to be running around. I'd be happy to, to continue having um, one on one conversations. But Matt needs you guys to do something. Yeah, uh, real quick, we only have 30 more minutes in the meeting. I, I want to just give everybody the opportunity to go to the boards and be able to put some stickers on there to kind of help us understand what your preferences are. I really appreciate tonight's conversation. There's a lot of great feedback. This is exactly what we wanted. There's a lot that we need to take into account. There's a lot of things that we need to balance. So I really appreciate your wait, participation tonight. Wait, 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 and one more, yeah, one more time. So, uh, hi everybody. Um, before you do that, I just want to let you know um, I'm Council Member Anna Hochmer. I'm here. We have Council Member Shannon Del Prado. She's here. I think I heard the voice of future Council Member Ken Fairman. He was yeah, here. He just, he just left. But um, so uh, we're all interested. I happen to live in Swan Lake, so I'm right across the street. Um, we want to do the best we can for the community. <coughs> if you have feedback that you want to send directly to the council, you can send an email to us, one email, and it will reach all of our inboxes. And so if anybody wants to type it down in their, the notes on their cell phone, that email address is council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, at pinecrest-fl.gov. You can send that, and it will come to all of the council members, the village clerk, and the village manager. And we will make sure that the director of parks, Rob Mattis, gets all of the stuff that we think is for me. Okay, so please do reach out and let us know what you want and what you think. And okay. I have been taking copious notes on my phone about everything that everybody was saying. Reporting <laughs> <so laughs> back. Thank you. So, and thank you for coming. And please do put your stickers on.